I knew him, first of all, as a member of the slide library and eventually as the manager of the slide library. I knew him as the father of a friend because his daughter Elizabeth, now Kiego, worked for me when she was in school. And I knew him as a professor. I was a graduate student. I made the idiotic mistake of my first semester of graduate school, having never had any Asian art history in my life, of taking Sherman Lee's later Chinese painting. I didn't know one dynasty from another, much less one artist from another. I learned a great deal. It was the worst, I, worst class I ever had in graduate school, as far as my grade went. I eventually got to where he would talk to me about Chinese art. When I would <coughs> go to his office to get a list of slides that he wanted pulled, uh, he would write them all down for him, for me. And of course, the first problem was reading his handwriting in a foreign language. And this was still in Pinyin. I, I'm sorry, still in Wade Giles, not Pinyin yet. And he would write them down, I would pull them, and then he would put a lecture together. Well, eventually he got to where he would say, I don't, I want Shenzhou, or pull me a bunch of literati painters. So my problem was, I learned. He was intellectually terrifying. He would look over those half glasses of his and ask you a question, and you damn well better answer the way he wanted. But that, everybody thought he was generally terrifying, but he wasn't. He was a very kind-hearted, shy person who did not carry on small talk well. He had a very wry, dry sense of humor, and if you got him, you were in. He could talk to you. He would come into the uh, slide library and ask for the Bible, by which he meant the history of Far Eastern art, written by Sherman E. Lee. And one time I handed it to him, and he looked at the edges and said, the edges aren't gilt. It wasn't a proper Bible. But it was in the slide library that I learned that he was basically a human being. He would come in on Saturday, and I was the full-time staff member on Saturdays, and also in charge of cataloging Far Eastern art. And he would look at the slides I had pulled for him and weed them out to where he got a lecture that he was happy with. I was just the initial slide puller. And then he would sit there and sort out what he was saying while he was looking at the slides. And he would hum Old MacDonald's Farm off key. Or whistle it a little. Mostly he would hum. And at first I didn't believe this was him. And then one time I sort of crept around the slide cabinets and looked around and there he was humming away. So that tends to put a human face on him. He had the reputation of being such an elitist and he was just exactly the opposite. He was very much of the people. He just couldn't talk to them all. Reminds me of, of the Breuer wing in general, and he was very proud of that wing. And one of the interesting things about Sherman Lee is that he had lunch in the cafeteria and he ate with the staff. And you could end up having lunch with Sherman Lee any day. And that was another humanizing aspect to him. But one day at lunch, after the building had been opened, I looked at him and said, that wing is the last bastion of culture in the Western world. And he says, of course it is. I planned it that way. And I wondered at the time how much the tanks parked on the grounds and the snipers on the roof had to do with that. During the Huff Riots, 
And during that summer, there were snipers on the roof of the museum and there were tanks on the grounds. And I think that sort of meant to him or indicated to him that the idea of a bastion of art was not a bad one. Nothing happened, but they were coming that close. And he felt a strong desire to protect his art. That was he felt he was here to protect the art, to keep it safe, to explain it, to exhibit it with as little fanfare as possible. And like any nonprofit institution, we have always had financial problems. Despite the large um, endowment, there, there were always times when money was tight, like, there, like now. And the one thing that he ingrained into the staff and is still here is that the museum shall remain open for free. You can charge for the exhibitions, but you have to keep the museum open for free. And we would have um, large groups of, ec of education groups coming through. I don't know how large they are now, but it was just one group after another, busload after busload after busload. The, the Cleveland Public Schools had teachers here, as did other schools. They just they had offices here, they lived here. And lots and lots and lots of kids. And I remember any number of people that I have met over the years who say, I remember the art museum. I went there as a kid. To which I'd say, why haven't you been back? But that was his approach to art. First of all, you preserve it and then you present it to as many people as you can.